Boss, I'd like to speak to you. You ain't gonna like what I'm gonna say. And why say it? Somebody gotta say it. You're making a fool of yourself. And if you don't stop, you're gonna get hurt. And personally, I think you're gonna get hurt real bad. Stop talking, Sam. You don't know what you're talking about. I do that sometime. That's the way I am. And you the way you are. Aren't you supposed to shave before you come to work? This ain't Paris, and she ain't Miss Ilsa. I never said she was. You never said it, but you think it. From the moment you latched on to her, I could see it right there, and you thought she could be another Miss Ilsa. I don't need you to tell me what I think. I sure hope not, because people can't be somebody else, no matter how hard you try to change. You said enough. It's the 70th anniversary of Casablanca, and each invocation of the film seems to be joined by an admonishment for its sequel, currently in development. Considered by many to be a masterpiece, the film has not in recent times been considered a critical darling in the same way that Citizen Kane, or the newly crowned best film of all time, Vertigo, are routinely rated. But is the idea of a sequel to Casablanca really so strange? The film has become so ensconced in the pastiche of popular culture through cross-platform references, adaptations, vague remakes, parodies, and yes, even sequels, without the purity of the original being lost. It is still beloved. Indeed, while no film sequel exists as such, there is the Warner authorized follow-up novel, Michael Walsh's As Time Goes By, released in 1998. Casablanca is itself a slight retreat of Pepe Lamoco, and more specifically, the American remake Algiers, which are but only two examples of the framework of generic and thematic familiarity on which Casablanca was built. While a play and film, like Play It Again Sam, may draw attention to the relationship fans have with Casablanca, which somewhat explains this negative reaction to a sequel, the 1983 television series prequel is the best understanding of the process of cult fandom for the film. It may not be the most malign iteration of the film's story, which is most likely reserved for 1996's Barbed Wire, but the 1983 television series certainly did not attract enough of an audience, and the series was as quickly forgotten as the previous television prequel to Casablanca. In 1955, there was a version on ABC television's Warner Brothers Presents, which rotated three shows, one per week. The series starred Charles McGraw as Rick and Clarence Muse as Sam, and lasted for 10 episodes. Warner Brothers Television Distribution was created in 1960, and it tried this model again, selling a struggling NBC TV on the Casablanca series for debut in the spring of 1983. Starring Starsky and Hutch's David Soule as Rick and Scatman Crothers as Sam, the show was advertised as a limited series by the network. It's not immediately apparent whether this description suggests the series was a mid-season grasp at a boost in ratings, or the act of preemptively burying a series that was not working artistically, financially, or otherwise. In either case, there was the belief that the existing and popularly acknowledged cult of Casablanca would provide a built-in audience. The result was five self-contained episodes spread across three weeks with no conclusion to the series as a whole. The series takes place between the contemporary events of the film, but after the events recalled in the past of that film's story. Thus, Ilsa's effect on Rick is felt, resulting in the same character that audiences have come to love, while not necessarily compromising the memory of that character by allowing him to move on from Ilsa and, more importantly, the original film. The audience that the series was attempting to court was the cult of Casablanca, which was theorized only a year later in Umberto Eco's famous article, Casablanca, Cult Movies and Intertextual Collage. In this article, Eco develops a concept of cult cinema that recognizes Casablanca as the cult film par excellence. This status stems precisely from Casablanca's intertextuality, the plethora of ways that it is connected to other films specifically, 
and the concept of cinema as a whole. This intertextuality is alternatively the cause for what Echo calls its rickety and unhinged quality, its imperfection. In tandem, these two qualities ensure an audience's comfort with the film, even when watching it for the first time, but also the ability to recall and then reference the moments that have in turn become so famous. He writes, In order to transform a work into a cult object, one must be able to break, dislocate, unhinge it, so that one can remember only parts of it, irrespective of their original relationship with the whole. Some films require less transformation. The unhinged movie, like Casablanca, which survives as a disconnected series of images of peaks of visual icebergs. It should display not one central idea, but many. It should not reveal a coherent philosophy of composition. Echo finds this quality amplified in Casablanca because of its production, where the film, including its iconic ending, was allegedly made up day to day. He observes, Forced to improvise plot, the authors mixed a little of everything, and everything they chose came from a repertoire that had stood the test of time. When only a few of these formulas are used, the result is simply kitsch. But when the repertoire of stock formulas is used wholesale, then the result is an architecture like Gaudi's Sagrada Familia, the same vertigo, the same stroke of genius. The existence of these subsequent versions of the film makes sense when the original film's unhinged qualities are understood. There is a pervasive desire by fans to return to the original text, which never exists as a coherent whole, and thereby never fully satiates this desire even on its own. The film, through its unhinged quality, creates a scenario that according to Echo, provides a completely furnished world that enables and invites fans to quote characters and episodes as if they were aspects of the fans' private, sectarian world. In this sense, a television version, particularly a network television version from the 1980s, is the perfect manifestation of this act of fandom. Not only are television shows often centered around a place that the viewer figuratively returns to each week, but serialization was not the dominant mode of television shows outside of soap operas, meaning that this story is refreshed each week. Indeed, lost in the canonization and quotation of Casablanca is the film's title, which emphasizes the importance of its plays rather than its characters in particular, the way the source play had in its title, Everybody Comes to Ricks. With the series, one recognizes the place as an abstract concept, a space that is returned to in order to spend more time with the characters, recycled themes, and references that are so beloved. It's like attending a convention where fan fiction is being shared. However, this creates a space of self-referencing through its built-in cult audience, which is where the series becomes most interesting. By not literally recreating the original, there is a distance that draws attention to the desire for the original on the audience's part. The 1983 television series is entirely modeled after performing the original story in miniature each week, calling to mind memories of the film visually, in the stories, and even with ancillary new characters. By distilling the plot of the original and economically reducing any frills that would exceed an hour, there is a tension between the pleasures of revisiting the original and the audience's awareness that the beloved experience has been codified, the latter becoming apparent immediately when watching a second episode. So what are these properties taken from the original to appeal to its cult? Let's first look at the title montage, which in many ways encapsulates what the series is hoping to achieve, that is to say, the audience it is hoping to attract. The first shot is of the Casbah, the location of the series, which is framed in such a way that there is a proscenium arch, acknowledging both the place and the type of self-aware recreation that is occurring in the series. The Casbah is the setting of the series even more than Rick's Cafe, which is revealed in the subsequent shot. This shot is the first one that references an iconic image from the original film. The next two shots show an important juxtaposition that differentiates the series from the original film. The interior of Rick's with Sam on piano, which alludes to the original film, followed by a shot of the Blue Parrot Cafe that is more indicative of the actual locale, and where Sam is replaced by the salacious belly dancer so common throughout the series.
The introduction of each character, looking directly into the camera with their character name included, interestingly deploys a convention of title sequences to television at that time, but also recognizes the familiar look and names of these characters. It is at once familiar as television and as a Casablanca prequel. All of this is naturally set to as time goes by, and Sam notably gets the emphatic final shot of the sequence, not Rick. Indeed, as the misquote instructs, it is Sam who fans compel to play it again, returning to the same story, just as Sam is the character who prompts the important memories of the characters in that story. In return, Sam is the one who appeals to the characters and audiences alike, stating, you must remember this. The world will always welcome lovers as time goes by. It follows that the series also delivers on the element that most fans would expect, as well as what fans perform themselves, the repetition of memorable lines from the original film. Yet this practice is somewhat limited, reserved in this case to where it pertains just as much to the quirk of the character of Louis and the repetitiveness of his position. Repeat it any more, and it would be pandering to a perceived desire of the audience, but the absence of any direct reference would run the risk of deviating too far from what was enjoyed in the film. Round up the usual suspects. The precarious relationship to the original serves as the humorous irony of the second episode's reporter character, who is an avatar for the audience. Casablanca is North Africa, and Rick's Café American is Casablanca. Everyone knows that. What they don't know, or won't tell, is what they know about you. Yet her desire to find out more about Rick eventually results in her light exploitation in order to have the Ilsa Victor replacement, here the same character, escape. Like the desire to return to the original film, this episode makes it clear that in being a fan of the film, the audience is also consigned to being left behind at the end of the story. This is not the only self-aware reference to the cult of Casablanca. Conversations about being new here recur in the show. If you have been in Casablanca for any length of time, you are used to these searches. If you are new to Casablanca, you will get used to them. You are new to Casablanca, Mademoiselle? Delaney. Jenny Delaney. I just got here from the sunny south of France. And I may write Michelin about this pastry. At once reaffirming that Casablanca is a place, that a television series is a process of continually returning to that place for the viewer, that Casablanca as a cult film provokes this continual renewing process, and that this renewal occurs self-consciously in the series through new characters replacing Ilsa and Victor in each episode. Yet the reason Ilsa and Victor are replaced is the chronological position of the series, the limbo of its situation between Rick and Ilsa's past in France, yet before the film story. This time period allows the series to inject new stories, genres, and themes to the intertextual mix that constitutes the original film without building on the original story or altering the foundational backstory. In this sense, the series is continuing the project of the original, but this also seems to be what many detractors point to as the biggest flaw of the series, its essential frivolity. Yet where the series does not necessarily expand the story of Casablanca in any meaningful way, it is able to explore other avenues. Sam is given slightly more to do, as well as a wider musical repertoire. The sexual component of the original can be more directly alluded to due to the shift in restrictions on representation. Further updates also include the spectrum of allusions to other films, such as Indiana Jones, as well as including distinctly television-aimed special effects. Even Rick's backstory is slightly elaborated upon, even if it's in a somewhat vague manner. It's only been three years since Barcelona. Do you remember we found you hiding in the theater? And we smuggled you out of Spain in a wardrobe trunk? How could I forget? Perhaps the most significant expansion is how the series takes the location into account more than just as a meeting ground between the Nazis and the French, 
that define the forget it, Rick, it's Casablanca tone of the original. The Casbah and its culture are the basis for the entire last episode of the series, while the reality of Rick's network of connections is explored in greater depth in the final episode. If there ever existed the possibility for more episodes, it seems likely that the interaction between Rick and his locale would continue to take the fore, recognizing the strengths of episodic television and adapting to that mode rather than try to replicate or perform the original. Which again brings us to the upset expectations of fans watching the series. It clearly models itself on an episodic format that is repetitive in order to be perpetual. The possibility of popularity means the series must aim to sustain itself as long as possible. And like the absence of Lacan's Le Objet Petit A, the absence of Ilsa, and by association Victor, permits a rotating series of temporary replacements in each episode. They can never quite satisfy the desire from the audience, but aim to provide a temporary satisfaction. Here, that's almost a manifestation of the very process of nostalgia, to think fondly of what's missing through its surrogate. To characterize this quality as a failure of the series is to underestimate the project, which self-consciously alludes to this absence, acknowledging that, like an asymptote, the series approaches the original film constantly without ever reaching it. Like the direct references to the original, the formulaic plot is at once a gesture towards the film, while also enabling the series to function in its own right, avoiding affecting the original story in a way that would offend its fans. Thus, each episode establishes the space, Sam is given an early or mid-episode musical number, David's soul does an adequate portrayal of Bogart's weathered Rick. Don't argue with me, Sam. I want you to go and enjoy yourself. Certainly better than Charles McGraw's approximation. Remember that they make mistakes too. And there is a girl and a member of the Resistance, sometimes the same character, who require Rick's aid. The inescapable absence of Victor and Ilsa, as we've discussed, remains the most interesting tension, as this both enables the series as well as limiting its ambition. We've also discussed the similarities to the original and the differences, recognizing how there is a hedged bet in balancing the two, but the series definitely acknowledges this absence. Thus, Ilsa is mentioned in a few different iterations. The most self-aware instance is when Rick grooms a woman to be Ilsa. And she ain't Miss Ilsa. I never said she was. You never said it, but you think it. From the moment you latched on to I could see it right then. You thought she could be another Miss Ilsa. I don't need you to tell me what I think. I sure hope not, because people can't be somebody else, no matter how hard you try to change. You said enough. Okay, there was somebody else. And he ain't over her yet. Maybe never will be. What kind of somebody? Somebody in Paris. Her name was Ilsa Lund. Really, somebody? Oh, yeah, yeah. What was she like? What you want me to say? You were prettier than her? She was prettier than you? Truth is, you ain't even enough alike to compare. But you do remind me of her one way or another. And that's what this is all about. You remind him. Especially since he made you over. Listen to me. You smiled. You laughed the way she does. That's, that's what I saw when I met you, but not now. Now I see Jenny Delaney. Nobody else. Do you expect me to believe that? It's the truth! I'm dumb, but not that dumb. Well, the direct comparison of a woman to Ilsa is made again in the series' final episode. Couldn't your family arrange it for you? I almost arranged it for myself once. In Paris. Didn't work out. It's different with us. Tell me about her, the woman you wanted to marry. Why? 
She must have been very fine. I would like to know because for the first time in my life, I feel I can become better. She was no better than you. You can't be serious. What am I, nothing? Oh, don't say that. You're a woman with a lot of class. A lot of guts. Ultimately, the most self-aware aspect of this formula is the way the memorable ending to the original is invoked at the end of almost every single episode, while nonetheless pointedly resisting the famous final line of dialogue. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. This best encapsulates what is happening in the series, a careful balance between calling to mind the pleasures of the original without necessarily regurgitating them while also representing the process of the cult of Casablanca by illustrating what makes the return to the original film so desirable. Ilsa and Victor abandon the audience each time, like Rick and Louis, and the obsession over this act, and the relationship it creates between Rick and Louis, is the drive behind returning to the story. The series recognizes this by formulaically using it almost every time, drawing attention to its contribution to developing the cult interest in the film while also utilizing the same function in ensuring the audience returns for the next episode of the series. The series may not be a significant contribution to television, or a particularly interesting contribution to the story of Casablanca, a risk it perpetually avoids despite compulsory gestures in this direction. Yet it is a consistently interesting case study of how the formula of an episodic television series from the early 80s could represent the process of being a fan of a cult film. Its banality is its greatest tool and the manner in which it deploys the simple pleasures of returning to a specific place through a television series allows for it to completely encapsulate what Echo described as the cult qualities of Casablanca, its cliches, its accidents, and its repetitions. The series takes these unhinged qualities and turns them into a formula, which lays bare these vital components of the original film and the process of cult itself. You must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by.